Good to see you in Norway, Professor John Gunderson. It's Come. very nice to be here. Mm -hmm. Nice to hear. You're coming from uh, McLean Hospital, Boston, yes. United States. And you have been in this field always, uh, haven't you? Yes. Yeah. I, I started out, uh, I, my first visit to Oslo was for a schizophrenia conference. And uh, uh, I fell in love with Oslo, but uh, not so s long after that, my studies on atypical schizophrenia took over, and uh, that became borderline personality disorder. Mm. Yes. And so, and that was in um, the 1970s? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, what we are going to do today is to have a conversation on borderline personality disorder and uh, your role in the development of the field and possibly some speculations uh, about uh, the future. So, let's start with this. Uh, how is the borderline field, so to speak? By that I mean the patients, the therapists, the professional atmosphere, the m modern understanding as well as societal aspects. How is that now in these days compared to when you started in the 1970s? Uh, when I started my training in psychiatry, which was in 1968, um, there was very little literature about borderline personality disorder per se. Um, and the field of psychiatry was dominated by psychoanalysis in the training program I was in at Harvard. So there was this group of patients that didn't have a diagnosis, um, but which drove everybody crazy. And so we spent a lot of time uh, talking about what to do with them and for the most part they were given psychotherapies from which they got worse and um, uh, that was the start of my interest in this group of patients even before I left tra residency training I did the first effort to sort of describe who they were and then a few years later, when I was working at the National Institute of Mental Health in the field of schizophrenia, this atypical schizophrenia thing was always on the margins. Mm -hmm. And um, I... Yes, because borderline, the very notion or the, uh, the known, it says something about at the border of yes, something. Yes, it was on the border of something. and. Yes. Uh, uh, Haga Kiskel famously said it's an adjective in search of a noun. Yes. Uh, and that the noun at that time was schizophrenia. So I had this uh, opportunity, being a schizophrenia uh, fellow, to try to identify who the people with atypical schizophrenia were. And that uh, involved a literature review called Defining Borderline Patients, which was published in 1975. Mm -hmm. And um, all I, so, and that became a, uh, the lead of our, the article, the cover article in the American Journal of Psychiatry. So all of a sudden, though all my studies were really schizophrenia, I became famous for defining borderline patients. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was... Uh, that was a lucky move then. Well, it was a mixed blessing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, when I moved to McLean Hospital in 1973, uh, they wanted me to do grand rounds on, not on schizophrenia, but on borderline personality. Mm. On grand rounds, that is lectures. Uh, yeah, the, the main the lecture for the hospital community. Yes. And the room was filled. And I was still young and new to the hospital and certainly 
didn't know much about borderline personality disorder, though this definition that I started at that mm. time had... Uh, so you were courageous then? <laughs> I wouldn't say so. I would say I had my, the, the only panic attack I've ever had in my life was when I got up in front of this group of people who looked to me to be have expertise on a group of patients that I'd helped define. And the only reason I'd helped define them really was they scared me. <laughs> it's a good obsessive compulsive mechanism to sort of distance yourself from a phenomena. I didn't really ever dream that this was something that I was going to. But, but then, you know, I, this, I had a, this was being to be your career. Yes, I didn't imagine that. But I was running a schizophrenia unit at McLean Hospital, and all of a sudden, I didn't get any patients who were schizophrenic. I got all these patients who were at the border. Yes, at the border, and. Um, then I did a more formal piece of research with a, developed a structured interview and did the, got comparison groups and then showed what were the discriminating characteristics of this. And that got published. And then uh, it got accepted by the DSM-3 and it became an official mm -hmm. classification in 1980. That was a breakthrough, wasn't it? Oh, major breakthrough, mm. yes. Uh, it was um, sort of unexpected. I mean, the whole diagnosis was pretty new at that time. Otto Kernberg had popularized the idea that there were a large group of patients called with borderline personality organization who viewed through a psychoanalytic lens could be responsive to long-term intensive psychoanalytic psychotherapies. And so within the psychoanalytic community, there was a lot of enthusiasm about treating these patients. And uh, I was amongst those who was doing psychoanalytic training and hoped that by doing this, I would become one of those elite therapists who by virtue mm. of tolerance, patience, yes. and uh, perseverance would be able to treat borderline patients. Yes, so that was a part of you, but another part was the empirical researcher. And what did the empirical researcher find? Well, the empirical researcher, um, <coughs> one of the first things I did was uh, uh, wonder where the successful cases were. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I had just, I was in the process of studying psychotherapy with schizophrenic patients and everybody, all my teachers had said, this is what you know, really great therapists can do. But I learned when I got close to the subject and talked to all the great teachers that they didn't treat schizophrenic patients. And here I was in a hospital where many people were doing treatments with borderline patients, but I didn't see very many successes. And uh, when I looked at the literature, 54 books were written by psychoanalysts about the treatment of borderline patients. Um, they didn't ever include successful case reports. What mm. they chronicled was the difficulties they encountered and it was, so I, um, uh, that was a form of research. I started systematically looking for successful case reports and found five. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when you looked at what the therapies were like, there was a lot more support in those therapies and a lot more direction in those therapies mm. than the psychoanalytic model suggested. Yes. yes. And uh, it was sobering and it also taught me what I was learning clinically that it wasn't, it did not work to sort of be uh, passive and it did not work to sort of follow the patient's lead. You had to be active with these patients. Mm. And you had to be comfortable setting limits. Mm -hmm. It was not 
sufficient to say, I want to understand you. Mm. Uh, the patients viewed that with a certain amount of contempt. And um, yes, but since that time, much have uh, much has changed. Much has changed, and um, it's the very conceptualization of what is the disorder about. You help to define the criteria. Yes. And, uh, uh, and uh, also in the discussion of what are the underlying mechanisms, what are then, what are then the appropriate treatments, uh, yeah. etc. So, how, how is the field today, in, uh, uh, according to your view? Well, you've identified two major <coughs> arenas in which our thinking has changed. The understanding of the etiology or the causation of this disorder and our understanding of what effective treatments constitute. And uh, with respect to the first, back then it was entirely environmental. Mm -hmm. uh, was um, largely, the patients would tell us, you know, they have their problems because of their dysfunctional families. And often enough, the families did look dysfunctional, and that was sort of accepted. And um, um, the uh, research, some of the original research into this showed that the disorder ran in families, which for the rest of psychiatry, that meant that there might be something genetic about it, but a lot of us simply interpreted that as you know, the mother is a borderline or borderline and that's an environmental causation. So it was a landmark discovery, uh, finding, when uh, your countryman Sven Turgesson in 2001 did the first twin study. He'd done a small twin study a long time before that, which was not very revealing, but 2001 he did the first significant twin study and uh, identified a heritability of about 56, 58 percent. And that was shocking. Uh, so much of the theorizing, so much of the clinical care based on those theories was on the idea that this was all mm -hmm. matter of the environment. Yeah, so that um, became um, more um, more acute, so to speak. You have to take in something about the biology, about the nature, and uh, this heritability yes. and the kind of temperament disposition. What is that all about in uh, your uh, view? Well, there's a uh, uh, couple strong candidates for it. Um, one is what I would call the interpersonal hypersensitivity. That is that the child who goes on to develop borderline personality disorder is innately hypersensitive within their interpersonal interactions. And for instance, a mother who frowns is going to be seen as hostile or punitive, or a mother who leaves the room is going to cause alarm that they'll never come back. And that that's more sustained and more uh, acute in the children who develop this disorder. Uh, the second major hypothesis is that the um, predisposition is, um, has to do with emotional, problems with emotional control so that it is not linked so much to adverse environment uh, or especially interpersonal events as it is to a problem when there's adversity of a wide range of things. The child with a disposition for borderline personality disorder will have excessive, inappropriate uh, emotional responses to that. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's uh, uh, some of the temperamental. Yes. Um, uh, uh, Those are the two main candidates. Yes, yes, and then comes the attachment uh, problems on yes. top of of that, and I think this 
hypersensitivity also makes the attachment process more difficult, perhaps, from the parent uh, part. Uh, yes, uh, this gave, gives yeah. rise to a more um, complicated and sophisticated formulation uh, in which it is not simply poor parenting, but that the poor parenting may in part be related to a child who is difficult, mm -hmm. innately difficult. Yeah. And uh, so that the child with a genetic disposition for borderline personality disorder, whatever that is, is going to be difficult for parents. And you might take an unusual set of parents to provide the calm, um, stable, reflective environment mm. which would um, lead that child away from developing this disorder into um, having a relatively normal outcome. Yeah. But I'm a lot of parents who have vulnerabilities of their own are those are the vulnerabilities. Somebody's very anxious, somebody's very reactive, somebody's very irritable. Those are going to get exacerbated uh, by a child like this, and they'll make the parenting worse. Yes. And out of that comes problem with mentalizing. Yes. For the part of Attachment the... Attachment and mentalizing. Yeah, for the part mm -hmm. of the child. And if we add traumas, real traumas, yes into that uh, picture, yes. then we got a strong, strong risk for borderline development. Yes. Uh, it was worth uh, noting historically that it was in the 1980s that our awareness of the role of trauma uh, in the background of not just borderline patients, but many patients was, became, we became aware of it. We started then taking much more seriously patients' reports about having trauma in their childhoods. Mm. Uh, the psychoanalytic community, sadly, in retrospect, starting with Freud himself, had seen these as uh, fantasies and um, not given them the credibility that they deserved. Mm. When that changed in the 1980s, the response was that people with borderline personality disorder, because 70% of them will report childhood uh, trauma, really are the victims of trauma, and that to call this a personality disorder was an error, because they were, it was actually re-victimizing them by suggesting that they had some accountability in the development of their disorder. And when you have a treatment which asks them to take responsibility for themselves, that was re, you know, re-victimizing them. Mm. And it was very, it was a very difficult time for those of us who had developed the borderline personality disorder diagnosis. Uh, we became vilified ourselves we were male for the most part, and we were blaming the victims. Mm. Um, so it was, uh, uh, that, that was another um, obstacle to the development of a, uh, the disorder, its acceptance. Yeah, and, and that was to put the question of trauma in its proper place, yes, it not not under, not denying it, but not over, give it a, an extra weight yes. either. Yes, yes, yeah. and that has taken time to do that. Yes, so this points to uh, the how sh to the difficult question of um, uh, the families of borderline uh, patients, because some of these families uh, are dysfunctional, some are not so dysfunctional. Yes. And, um, and you are known as a person who uh, have been an advocate for, uh, for, um, yeah, for integrating the family work within, uh, within the treat total treatment system to 
haven't you? It's uh, the oh, yeah. yeah. The family aspect has has preoccupied uh, you. Um, can you tell tell a bit more about uh, well, uh, that part of it? It was in the 1990s that um, I became impressed by just what the observation you made that sometimes the families of borderline patients appear not to be so dysfunctional. And this was before the genetic evidence came in by Sven Turgesson. Um, and it, uh, it became clear to me that the families themselves are subjected to the same kind of problems that we clinicians lament and write many, many books about how difficult these patients are. Mm. But we were comfortable saying, well, the, the p parents are the cause of it rather than the <laughs> parents. Uh, are suffering the same. Yeah, only they don't do it for a couple hours a week. Yes. You know, they <laughs> have had a difficult family member for much of their lives. And, of course, at that point, uh, my kids are adolescents and I'm wondering, you know, what kind of parental damage I've done and that... Uh, you know, I'm much more identified now with the problems of the parents than I was as a younger man. And um, so uh, we started doing multiple family groups uh, in which a more compassionate view of parents was uh, introduced. That is, they um, are suffering from the difficulties of a difficult child. And they turned out to be remarkably responsive to this. Mm -hmm. Rather than being these terrible people, it was clear that they all were doing the best they could. And sometimes, of course, what they were doing was damaging, but it was never willful. And for the most part, they were very grateful for the opportunity to talk about their problems mm -hmm and were grateful for advice about how they might change. Mm. It, was, it was a startling contrast, in a way, with the previous view of the families that I had had, and a contrast with the views of the families which the patients themselves often presented. And uh, it was uh, gratifying to have parents who were so receptive to help, mm -hmm. uh, much more uh, easy to work with than yeah. their sons and daughters. And I, I think that perhaps uh, uh, this, uh, this effort to, to, to integrate the parents and talk to the parents also paved the way for a more psychoeducational yes. approach. It did. Yes. Yes, it did, yes. Now, you probably have gone through the same process as yourself. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, no, psychoeducation became a major part of what I and probably others started doing, uh, where you talked with parents about the disorder, what the criteria meant, what the expected course was, mm. Um, our models <coughs> of etiology at that time were not as sophisticated as they are now, and as I outlined a few minutes ago, but they were good enough, that is, that there's some kind of disposition in the child which uh, interacts and makes parenting difficult. And that was great comfort to them. And it sort of helped the p patients and the parents step away from the parent blaming thing as well as having the mental health field step away from parent blaming. Mm. Uh, it was a very positive step. Yeah. And when you, when you have, when you do practice this psychoeducational approach, then you have come quite a bit away from psychoanalysis, haven't you? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, yes. No, and then uh, it just progressed in my practice and in that of the uh, programs that I oversee, um, it became uh, 
more medicalized. That is, this is a serious psychiatric disorder. Mm -hmm. And that... Um, uh, mm. Yeah, could we, could we talk a bit about that? Because um, uh, you are here in Norway also to talk about um, uh, your model of uh, good psychiatric management. And you have had a uh, workshop yesterday yes. about this, uh, this topic. Uh, uh, could you explain it uh, shortly? And then after we can discuss a bit uh, this, this topic about medicalization. Yeah. Um, good psychiatric management. I've been writing since 1984 books. Every five years or so, I update it about treatment of borderline personality disorder. And the books have always been meant to be sort of comprehensive about what's known about treatment with my own clinical wisdom or experience woven into that. And uh, I never saw myself as having a model of treatment per se just sort of synthesizing and um, what's known and mm. giving a broad overview which would be widely educational. It was something of a surprise then in 2009 when some Canadian colleagues did a big study on, they were primarily interested in demonstrating an, another demonstration of dialectical behavior therapy's usefulness in a broader sector of society. And they chose as a comparison group what they called general psychiatric management, which was sort of derived from these, these books I've been r writing, the latest of which I'd written with the help of Paul Lynx, a Canadian colleague. Uh, and um, so they condensed that into, and that was going to be, guide the comparison group. The remarkable thing was then that this general psychiatric management did as well as the dialectical behavior mm -hmm. therapy. So all of a sudden, you know, there was maybe something else, you know, that, that I was not simply a generalist who is espousing general principles, or those general principles might be good enough for most patients without the additional training that um, DBT and other evidence-based treatments require. And um, so, a workshop yesterday here in Oslo. It's uh, my mission in this last chapter of my career to uh, tell the mental health professions that you don't have to be a specialist. Mm -hmm. uh, you use good sense and um, uh, you can do well by most of these patients. Um, that, and that's big news in a way because mm -hmm. the most mental health professionals have concluded along the line that these patients are horrible yes. to treat and if you're going to do it, you better become a specialist with a whole lot of training, mm. and that's the only way you can treat them. And that's yeah. never going to yeah, answer. It's a, lo it's a lot of uh, misconceptions uh, in the field, uh, taboos, old habits, myths going, yes. going on, uh, and yes. here you come and say that, well, uh, you can... Uh, you if you if you do such and such and such and such in an ordinary yes and it's it it is not necessary to have it uh, as a very special kind of uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah making it more like yeah to the everyday user yeah. friendly it's mm. called a generalist model mm. and one that can be taught within training programs mm. you know you can't expect psychologists and psychiatrists to want to go through extensive training for borderline patients. Mm. Well, you could. We well, it's a lot to ask because it takes up a, a large sector of the 
crowded curriculum and the competition for that time. Mm. But, but it could be done. And, uh, and uh, so I think that's a question, uh, is it a bit a question about that's the, interesting. the culture of psychiatry in yes. the United States compared to Europe, Scandinavia, Northern Europe, uh, Norway, and um, I'm a bit concerned when you stress this, this medicalization uh, as a part of this, uh, this model. And I wonder how much, how much that reflects American psychiatry, American yes. culture. American psychiatry is not in good shape uh, these days. There and the position of psychotherapy in the training of of psychiatrists uh, is not, uh, as far as I have got it, is not highly prioritized. Absolutely, uh, yes. and I'm, uh, actually, in I shouldn't be uh, surprised by what you're saying, but it drawing my attention to something that I should have recognized more, that is that the psychotherapies remain a more central part of the training programs in uh, Scandinavia in particular, but uh, Europe maybe more generally than in the United States. In the United States, only about 15% of psychiatrists primarily uh, do psychotherapy. And the rest of them That's a shame. primarily do psychopharmacology. Mm -hmm. And the training programs sometimes teach almost nothing about psychotherapy. And those that do, like the program that I'm involved with, is actually more enlightened than most of the, uh, you know, it's still got a very important role. But the training has often been um, uh, psychodynamic, therapies without much attention to empirically based treatments because mm, mm. the supervisory staff are from another generation yes and there's been an effort to introduce cognitive behavioral paradigms which are uh, again it's hard for residents without a lot of time and effort and good supervision to acquire skills in one or the other let alone both um, in any event you are right that uh, it may well be a United States phenomenon that more so than the rest of the world, or certainly this part of the world, that my advocacy appeals to. That is, I'm fighting an uphill struggle in the United States. Interestingly, um, since I've started doing this, the, it's been found to be very appealing mm -hmm. because most res Good to hear. most uh, residency programs are now trying to redress the balance as um, um, there are many reasons for that but uh, one of the appeals of going into our field has always been the stories that patients tell. Mm. Listening to patients is the primary source of satisfaction for psychiatrists. And, and partake in it as it uh, is in, enacted in the here and now. And then to become a participant yes, in, the, in, yes. in, in the process <coughs> of active listening and uh, introducing change is of still a very exciting, maybe the most exciting thing, appeal of psychiatry. Mm -hmm. But as it's gotten pushed further and further towards a biological only paradigm, there has been a backlash against that. And um, it, it, partly due to the, uh, the appeals that residents themselves make, they want to learn psychotherapies, partly due to the fact that the high hopes from biological treatments have now been put more in perspective. They are mm. the whole ideal that there are specific chemical imbalances for specific illnesses mm. 
is really not hold, held up. And to the, the contrary. To the contrary. It seems that it creates more problems than, yes. Uh, yes. So, yes. Um, and the effectiveness yeah. of yeah. medications is much less than advertised. Yes. And uh, that when you... And you know, this is a big concern. Uh, there is a there the debate now going on on the role of psychiatry uh, in the aftermath of the book of Alan Francis, uh, yes. the, um, uh, the Goetz book, uh, the books on uh, the question about society uh, inequality. This is uh, the borderline problems are also linked to um, the degree of inequality in a society. It is something which is related to poverty, bad parental uh, conditions, bad schooling, etc., yes. mm -hmm. which is reflected uh, in, yes. uh, in uh, attachment problems, in learning difficulties, criminality, etc., etc., yes. and takes root in the personality. This, all these things uh, are linked to, together, and I think yes. it's a growing awareness uh, of it. And from my point of view, thank heavens. Yes, <laughs> yes, for me too. Um, could we um, could we come back a bit to the uh, to the gender question, since uh, uh, since uh, the evidence of uh, of the effectiveness of the psychotherapies for borderline patients uh, uh, seems to be valid for females. Yes. Yes. 85% of the patients is in the studies, yeah. uh, they are females. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we actually don't know so much about, uh, about men and how they respond. And, uh, and the clinic you have in Boston, there's, that's only for females, isn't it? We have two programs. Mm -hmm. One is a residential program where people stay overnight, and uh, that's for females only. Our outpatient clinic, it's an IOP, intensive outpatient program, that's for males and females. So there you integrate uh, men? Yes. Yes. And we well, this is an interesting story. Um, one of the males treated in our outpatient program uh, is a famous football player, uh, Brandon Marshall. And uh, shortly after he left our program, he went public with the idea that he had borderline personality disorder and his life had been changed. Mm -hmm. by the treatment he received. Mm -hmm. Did he become a better football player? He was an all-star before <laughs> his treatment and he's been an all-star since <laughs> his treatment. The big difference is that he hasn't had any major problems with um, within his uh, uh, relationships uh, that made the newspapers and uh, that um, uh, was or that were so disruptive to his teams. Mm -hmm. So I, but his, he's the first uh, public figure that has ever gone, to my knowledge, public about having the diagnosis. And he put a male face on an otherwise mm -hmm. largely female yes. disorder. Yeah. And the result. And how come that it is a, Predominantly female. Uh, well, disorder. I had a great theory about this, but I now have to abandon it. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, it's predominantly female because little girls are inherently more affiliative, mm -hmm. and little boys are more inherently, um, I can't remember the, what the word was, but mechanistic. You know, mm -hmm. they, they like playing with hard toys instead of soft toys, and they don't. They don't cling as much to their uh, caretakers. And so I thought that was a good paradigm because this is a disorder that really has to do with that 
attachment and um, the uh, uh, problems of finding comforting uh, comfort in relationships with uh, caretakers. Well, that made sense. So when the first reports came out about there being an equal number of males, I simply thought, well, this is a methodological mm. error. Yes. You are thinking about the epidemiological uh, studies. Yes. yes. That's where it came to in our the, attention. In the, in the community, there is no gender problems. That's but right. in the treatment services, there is a large uh, yes. gender difference, yes. So, I'm afraid I have to give up that very appealing theory, uh, but the fact is that there are just as many males as there are females when you get out in the community. They still, well, Brandon Marshall's influence is, for us locally has been that we now see more male clients, patients, than we used to. They're still a minority. And uh, uh, we are going to open a program this year for male borderline patients only. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's <laughs> that, that is, talk about the future, I see that as one of the things which will happen in the future. Is yeah. there more males with this, the di diagnosis will be given more readily to males, and males will be more likely to seek treatment mm -hmm. for it. Um, uh, but I think most of the males have ended up in substance abuse programs. Mm. Yes. Or in the forensic area. Yes. So, uh, so you have to have some strategy for dealing with the drug problem and the antisocial problem with uh, when you take in those uh, those males. males. But it's, you say it's uh, a, there's yeah. there are significant comorbidities for females also, but they get less emphasized if someone's female and they get exaggerated mm. if one's male. Mm. And that's just the way it's been. Mm. We are approaching uh, the end. Uh, it's um, in your lifelong uh, career. Um, uh, dealing with uh, uh, these borderline problems, deep existential problems, uh, uh, how society uh, contributes to identity disturbances, etc. Uh, what's the rewarding thing about it? It's a hard question to answer with any confidence. Um, I know that somewhere around 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I felt like the level of intimacy that borderline patients required of me um, was greater than I had elsewhere in my life. Mm -hmm. They required that I listen to things which I would not have heard or would not have wanted to mm -hmm. hear. And um, like the Grinch, my heart grew a bit larger because of this. Um, and certainly my tolerance for um, and, un and interest in understanding people who appear to be so offensive and demanding changed as a result of my work with them. Now that might have happened anyway. You know, we all grow up. Mm -hmm. And there are some people who have those qualities without mm -hmm. ever treating borderline patients. Mm -hmm. So. I can't say for sure, but I think that it's um, made uh, me a more benevolent person. Mm, yes, and perhaps more vital, since I agree with you, since borderline uh, patients, they, they demand uh, your presence. 
uh, you can't uh, you can't be absent and sleep uh, and you have to be there you have to be vigilant present absolutely and uh, so you have to you have to keep uh, keep alive stay alive right there <laughs> yes now, if you blink your eyes they'll notice it <laughs> yes yeah okay thank you very much professor john gunderson for this conversation on the topic of borderline personality disorder thank you professor sigmund